If you've ever been to Florida, there's a pretty good chance that you've had at least one encounter with a manatee. Whether you saw an image of one on a t-shirt, a stuffed animal in a gift shop, or have had the pleasure of observing one in its own natural habitat, it's hard to leave Florida without at least hearing the name manatee. Affectionately known as sea cows due to their mild temperament and strictly vegetarian diet, manatees are the state's official marine mammal. A true symbol of conservation, it's hard to stress just how important these animals are to tourists and Floridians alike. A subspecies of the West Indian manatee, the Florida manatee inhabits the state's coastal waters, rivers, and springs. Measuring 9 to 10 feet long and weighing in at around 1,000 pounds, the Florida manatee can consume 4 to 9% of its own body weight in seagrass per day, or around 100 pounds. In fact, one could even say that grazing is their full-time job as they spend 6 to 8 hours per day chowing down on aquatic vegetation, two and a half sleeping, and the rest getting photographed by tourists, presumably. Truly a life most would be envious of, the Florida manatee might just be the chillest marine mammal on the planet. But despite their status as a marine mammal, they are actually more closely related to elephants than they are to dolphins and whales. The Florida manatee is a living testament to the power humanity has to band together in a truly remarkable and selfless act of preservation. With the population of under just 1,000 in the 1960s, the future was looking pretty bleak for the Florida manatee, with boating collisions and habitat loss being attributed as the key factors of their population decline. That is, until 1973 when the good old US government introduced the Endangered Species Act, with manatees being one of the species included. In 1978, the Florida Manatee Sanctuary Act designated the state as a refuge and sanctuary for manatees, limiting boat speeds and manatee habitats across the state, as well as other regulations. Since then, their population has rebounded to more than 7,500 as of 2017, which happens to be the same year they were reclassified from endangered to threatened. This population rebound was mainly due to boating restrictions and a hugely successful public awareness program. However, if not for their inclusion on the endangered species list and subsequent conservation programs, it is possible that the manatee would not enjoy its celebrity conservation status today, as it would probably be extinct. However, the story doesn't end there. Even though they were reclassified as threatened in 2017, many experts disagree with this decision, and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service is currently being petitioned to reverse the delisting by many reputable conservation organizations due to a drastic spike in manatee deaths since 2017. And while the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a national organization, reclassified the Florida manatee to threatened, the IUCN, or International Union for Conservation of Nature, still has them listed as endangered. So which agency is right? What did the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service see that the IUCN missed regarding the current conservation status of the Florida manatee? Well, as it turns out, the decision by the US FWS was largely motivated by a lawsuit filed against them by Save Crystal River Inc., a nonprofit organization dedicated to cleaning up Florida's waterways, urging them to reclassify the manatee as threatened, citing fears of increased boating restrictions and expanding manatee refuges. The group apparently worried the service would make all of Crystal River a manatee refuge that forces boats to go at idle speed greatly lengthening the time it takes to reach the Gulf of Mexico. Steve Lamb, vice president of Save Crystal River, remarked that doing so would kill the recreation boating. While this decision to delist the animals didn't overturn any existing manatee protections, many experts fear that it will downplay the severity of the manatee's current precarious situation. For what it's worth, it appears that this nonprofit has done quite a bit for the Crystal River ecosystem, at least according to their website, but I was unable to find out much information about them from any other source, and I have to wonder why an organization dedicated to making Crystal River a beautiful and thriving home for sea life, our community, and visitors would spend so much time and resources to almost single-handedly dismantle a conservation status put in place to protect its most crucial sea life. Surely they had a reason other than wanting their boats to go faster. Right?
Regardless of their conservation status, the manatee is currently in dire straits as it is now the subject of a mass mortality event that is killing them off in droves. Starting in 2020, manatees began dying off at an alarming rate as they struggled to find enough food to make it through the winter. This unusual mortality event, as it has since been dubbed, is due mainly to a massive loss of seagrass attributed to pollution. This pollution is particularly bad in the Indian River Lagoon, a crucial manatee habitat that, due to decades of human waste, sediment from real estate development, and fertilizers from lawns and farms, has become too cloudy with pollutants for light to penetrate and allow seagrass to grow. Seagrass, the primary source of nutrition for manatees, has been disappearing at an unprecedented rate over the past decade. In fact, half of the seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon has disappeared since 2011. Rescue facilities are currently inundated with injured or starving manatees, and the mortality event got so bad in 2021 that a supplemental feeding program was launched to help prevent manatee malnutrition during the winter, the time when manatees are most vulnerable. This supplemental feeding program literally consists of Florida wildlife officials tossing romaine lettuce into the water. That's right, manatees are starving to death at such a rapid rate that wildlife officials are trying to keep them alive by tossing them lettuce. Literal grocery store lettuce. But as if pollution wasn't bad enough, it's actually only one of the manatees' myriad problems. Another major contributor to manatee habitat loss is a phenomenon known as red tide, a type of harmful algal bloom caused by a higher than normal concentration of the algae Carinia brevis. These algae, which grow in colonies, release toxins capable of harming other aquatic organisms, especially during periods when colonies undergo uncontrolled growth, or bloom. These periods of uncontrolled growth are caused by a variety of factors, but experts agree that these blooms are exacerbated by excess nutrients in the water. While one might think that extra nutrients in the water is a good thing, it's actually terrible. But the fact that they release harmful toxins is only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that this red tide makes the water too turbid or opaque or cloudy for light to penetrate. And when light isn't allowed to penetrate deep enough, plants aren't allowed to photosynthesize and manatees are left without a meal. But wait, we still have the increasingly erratic and unpredictable weather to consider. You see, Florida manatees can only survive in waters of 68 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer, and during winter, manatees seek out warmer waters either by traveling north or by seeking refuge in Florida's natural hot springs, some of which are inundated with swarms of manatees during winter months. Some manatees even seek shelter at power plants, where clean, warm water is discharged into waterways continuously throughout the winter. One such winter manatee haven is in a small town in Florida just north of Tampa named Crystal River, situated around Kings Bay, a spring-fed water system that maintains a consistent temperature of 72 degrees year-round. Because of this, the town can house as many as 600 manatees in its waterways during winter months, earning it the nickname Home of the Manatee, or the Manatee Capital of the World. That's all good and well, but what happens when winter supposedly ends in March and the manatees leave their winter refuges to go back home, only for the temperatures to take a dump on them as soon as they get back? For a manatee that's already left its winter refuge, having an unexpected mid-April freeze could spell the end of it. So what can we do? Well, at this point in the game, there's really not a whole lot that a single individual can do. You could spread awareness, sure, maybe even by sharing this video, or you can try talking about it to friends and family, but honestly, a problem like this needs to be addressed through policy change. As government policy, or lack thereof, is pretty much how we got here in the first place. In 2013, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, approved the state of Florida's annual limits on nitrogen and phosphorus discharge into the Indian River Lagoon. These limits are still in place today, and many experts agree that they are not nearly restricting enough. They stated that it would not adversely modify the Indian River Lagoon and affect any listed species, remarked Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. That clearly has turned out not to be the case. The EPA, the same agency that set the subpar nutrient discharge limits, calculated that it would cost $5 billion and take 20 to 30 years to reverse the Indian River Lagoon's ecological collapse. 
There have been several local and grassroots efforts to curb fertilizer discharge into Florida's waters, and one scientist went so far as to say that the Indian River Lagoon even made a minor rebound in water quality in 2022. But despite these efforts and signs of optimism, it is still too soon to get excited. But hey, at least those boating restrictions are still in effect. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe, you know, usual blah blah. Thanks.